If you've got 70 trillion of debt to refinance every year, you need balance sheet capacity to do that. And balance sheet capacity is a measure of liquidity. And so liquidity is the paramount factor in markets now. In a world of capital spending, sure, interest rates are relevant. But in a world of huge debt refinancing, what you've got to do is essentially get the capacity. And that is all about liquidity. Mike, fantastic to get you back on Real Vision. But I think it's the first time you and I have actually sat down and chatted. You're probably right, Ral. Yeah, I've been on Real Vision a few times. But uh, I think this is the first occasion. So first of many, really. Really looking forward to this. Um, I'd love for you just before, just to give people a bit of your journey, you know, where you came from and what you're doing now, just to frame it for people. Okay, well, if we, uh, if we start from now and work backwards, um, uh, Cross Border Capital was set up as an invi- advisory firm in uh, uh, the late 1990s. Uh, prior to that, I'd been head of research at uh, a company called Bearings, that you probably remember. <laughs> it, uh, remember well. it, it hit the headlines. Uh, and then prior to that, a, uh, uh, another firm that hit the headlines, Salomon Brothers. So I pretty much started my career at Salomon, uh, where I was a research director. And um, uh, in fact, before um, before uh, finance or before uh, Salomon, uh, I was in academia. So, um, and then I've made this uh, transition. But I've been in finance for well more years than I can remember since the mid eighties, really. Yeah, I was. Uh, I've been there since the very early nineties. So I was. James Capel, if you remember, when you were at Bearings, I was probably at Capel's, and then Nat West, and then Goldman. Familiar names. Your work on liquidity is, I think, truly exceptional, and you're one of the real thought leaders in this space. And I think a lot of people still don't fully understand what, how liquidity is driving things. So if you can talk through your top-level thesis of how this all works. And we'll, we'll dig into a lot because there's a lot of questions I want to ask you because I've been doing a lot of work on this myself as well. Okay. I think the, I mean, the starting point to say is that liquidity or understanding flow of funds was the, was the primary research tool at Salomon Brothers. I mean, that was basically how we understood the fixed income markets and the Forex markets. It was about liquidity flow. And if you remember the name Henry Kaufman, Henry Kaufman was uh, head of research at Salomon. He was a pioneer of flow of funds analysis. Uh, used to pour through the uh, Z1 accounts, as they were called, that the Federal Reserve puts out, and basically would come up with assessments of uh, US interest rate outlook. Uh, he used to call that Prospects for Financial Markets, which was an annual publication. I took the same template because you could see that liquidity was important. And I'll come in a second to define what we mean by liquidity, and basically put it into a global context. Uh, so to say, well, it wasn't just the Federal Reserve and the US that was now important. This was, you know, we're talking about the late 1980s, uh, early 90s. The world was becoming a bigger place. Other countries were uh, becoming uh, prominent. Uh, Japan was clearly a big example. Europe was sort of muscling into financial markets. There was deregulation, capital flows were winging around the world. And so you needed to have uh, something more than just a US vision. You had to look and see what other countries were doing. So that was really my, my template. In terms of what liquidity is and what we're measuring and what we're, how it's working, the first thing to say is it's not uh, about interest rates. It's not, a, it's not a substitute for saying, you know, let's look at what the Fed is doing with policy interest rates. Liquidity is a whole different dimension. And what we define it as, as the flow of cash and credit through global financial markets, okay? Now, it's not conventional money supply. Money supply, uh, as defined, is the um, retail deposit liabilities of high street banks, okay? So if you believe the financial system, that's all the financial system is, then I'll come quietly and say, well, okay, all we need to do is look at money supply. But banks are funded uh, now with other instruments besides retail deposits. Uh, they can get secured financing, they can issue debt, whatever it may be, they can go to repo markets. Uh, there's a whole host of other financing vehicles. And banks are not the only part of the equation. What you've got are wholesale banks, you've got uh, the repo system, uh, shadow banking, um, cross-border flows of money. Uh, essentially, you've got an international dimension and you've got a financial system that is becoming more complex and more 
uh, sophisticated, and so there are other sources of liquidity. So in many ways, a lot of the definitions that we use in terms of liquidity begin where the traditional monetary aggregates end. Okay, and that's probably a, a decent way of looking at it. Ours is a fundamentally wholesale measure of liquidity. It's very focused on the financial sector. It is not money supply. I'm not saying money supply is unimportant, but money supply is much more relevant for the real economy and spending uh, you know, in, in the real economy around the world. I've got a thesis, and I wanted to run it by you, that everything in the world changed in 2008 or nine. And the th obviously, we went to zero interest rates pretty much globally. And we started the use of the central bank balance sheets as a form of liquidity within markets. I noted, and it took me a while to realize this, but I noted that essentially, we then became incredibly cyclical. And you've pointed this out. And it was a light bulb moment when I saw that and I started digging into it is that it seems that everybody in the world reset all interest rates in 2009. And we seem to be at a three and a half year refi cycle. Can you talk us through your thinking around this? Because this is, I think, a lot of people don't understand this yet. And I think it's really crucial. Yeah, I think you, you make an extremely good point. Um, and let me let me try and, um, you know, start off with how we how we think about things. The first thing to say is if you pick up a textbook, whether it's a finance or an economics textbook, what they say are interest rates are the paramount factor to look at, okay? Now, in a world where you've got a lot of capital spending going on and you've got to compare a cost of capital with a return on capital, I'll come quietly and say interest rates matter. But that's not the world we're in anymore. We're in a world where there's huge amounts of debt refinancing going on. $350 trillion of debt worldwide with an average maturity of around five years means you've got to roll over something like 70 trillion of debt every year. Now, it doesn't matter so much what the interest rate is. I mean, clearly it's important, but that's not the critical point. Think of it in terms of a home mortgage. If you need to roll forward your home mortgage, refinance your home mortgage, it's not the interest rate that really matters to you that much. It's whether you get the roll. Because if you don't get the roll, you're homeless, right? And the same with a corporate. If you don't get the roll on your debt, you, you default. So it's the roll that's important. If you've got 70 trillion of debt to refinance every year, you need balance sheet capacity to do that. And balance sheet capacity is a measure of liquidity. And so liquidity is the paramount factor in markets now. In a world of capital spending, sure, interest rates are relevant. But in a world of huge debt refinancing, what you've got to do is essentially get the capacity and that is all about liquidity. If you do the math and you look at it in terms of, uh, let's quantify this, for every $1 of new financing in terms of capital spending, you've got $7 that are transacting in financial markets today for debt refinancing. So a seven to one ratio. That's why liquidity is so important. If you don't get that role, if you can't refinance, you have a refinancing crisis. And most of the crises that you look at historically, whether it's be 2020, 2019, the current situation, 2008, uh, 1997, they're all refinancing crises. So one of the things I've also looked at is I've looked at at a, at a broader level and thought, OK, GDP is the primary driver. It's, it's the revenue, everything that generates within the economy. So if I look at GDP growth, we can use the formula of productivity times you know, um, it's, it's productivity, demographics, and probably debt growth are the three components of GDP. And demographics are bad, so it slows GDP. Productivity has been terrible because of the demographics, and that's been slowing GDP. So we've we had debt growth. And that seemed to have got to a point where we got to that 100% of GDP in debt by the government sector. Now, what's really interesting, this is what I want to really dig in with you about, is I started looking at this and realizing... Well, if trend rate of GDP is like 1.75%, um, and interest rates, long-term interest rates are somewhere around the same, it's there's still 100% of GDP that goes in paying the government debt. And then the private sector is another 120% of GDP, excluding the finance sector. So there's not enough GDP to pay the interest. So... What I found out is that when I backed out the quantitative easing, I found out that it exactly matched the interest payments that were for the prior three and a half years. And so it seems that 
the Fed balance sheet is being used to monetize those interest payments so it doesn't crowd out the private sector, which is creating this massive cyclicality that we're seeing from the liquidity cycle. I don't know, have you looked into some of this? I haven't exactly, but it's what you're saying is extremely plausible. I think that's right. Um, and what you're what you're really saying is that a large part of the debt burden uh, that we're seeing every facing every year is actually interest payments. And if the Federal Reserve is having to come in and actually buy that debt, then you can see a very strong correlation between the interest bill and effectively QE. And I think that's uh, if that's true now, I can assure you it's going to be absolutely true in the future because the the way the government finances are working, uh, I mean, it, it looks absolutely terrible, uh, you know, over the next 10, 20 years. Now, within that context, the US is bad, but the US is the cleanest shirt in the laundry here. <laughs> Other countries are in a disastrous situation. And I was, I think I picked up on, uh, maybe it was it was listening to a Real Vision uh, interview you were doing maybe a couple of weeks ago or something, where you were making the point about tech and AI, and that is the future. And, you know, I, I go along with you, it is. But then you come back and you think, well, hang on, what are the implications of that for tax take? That's where it gets really scary, because what you've got is a situation where demographics are aging. OK, we know that. Mandatory spending is skyrocketing. Just look at the, the Congressional Budget Office projections here. They're looking really bad in the next, uh, in the next 10 years. OK, they really start to zoom up. But then look at the tax take. The tax take is based on conventional assumptions and the fiscal deficit gets big. But then if your thesis is correct, which I think it absolutely is, and you get this breakthrough in AI, you get job losses. Uh, how are you going to tax people uh, in that environment? The tax base at the moment is squeezed dry. You can't raise tax rates anymore. The more you raise tax, people are going to go offshore. Or they're going to find other ways uh, of working. And so the government is in a real dilemma. They haven't thought through this AI dimension at all. And so the only thing you've got is you've got to have the central banks coming in and doing QE. That's the only thing that's there. Yeah, because, I, look, I, I think the technology drives the productivity part, not not necessarily immediately, but over the next few years, I think we'll see productivity start to rise, particularly as some of the baby boomers, you know, um, leave the kind of the demographics. But they're going to have to tax the robots or they have to figure a new way of taxation. Because also, as we know, in this technology world, if we're not careful, it's going to accrue to some very, very gigantic firms. And they're going to have to think of some way of the tax take because the human population can't pay the taxes. It's just that they don't add up. People are going to be disenfranchised from technology. They don't want to be earning in the same way as they had before. The tax structure just won't, won't work. And so governments are going to have to rethink this whole thing. So it means you've got to do QE, which basically means that you know, reserve currency status in the world is going to be of paramount importance. And that's why the dollar is actually in a much, much better position than many people think. Exactly right. So this is why liquidity is so important, because it, the system does not function without it anymore. Before it was one of the key drivers, it's now the key driver. When I put together our kind of liquidity um, metric, and if we use just the even just the G5 central bank balance sheets as a simple proxy for liquidity, not as sophisticated as some of yours, the S&P correlation is 97.5%. Yeah. Yeah, because liquidity is everything. And one of the, the ideas that I've got that people still dismiss is that this is actually debasement of currency. So you're yeah. actively what you're doing is lowering the value of the denominator. Mm -hmm. um, the, the dollar is still king in all of this. People get confused because of currency versus the value of the purchasing power of fiat currency. But it seems that it values the, the, the denominator every time they use the balance sheets. Exactly right. And I think the thing is, is you've got to then look at uh, what I call monetary hedges to effectively to 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 uh, to avoid the problem of governments debasing money. Now, gold is the traditional monetary hedge. I think one of the ways that people get muddled by this is they associate gold as being an inflation hedge, a high street inflation hedge. It's not. Uh, it's never been that. It's always been a monetary inflation hedge. It so happens that monetary inflation can feed into high street inflation, but that's not the that's not the, the starting point. Is monetary inflation. And the other is crypto. 
Now, you know, if you look, if you combine, and I've probably uh, shown you charts before, and I think in a pack I sent over, I've got that that evidence. But if you look at uh, what they call monetary hedges, look at the market cap of gold plus the market cap of all crypto, that moves with liquidity almost one for one. Okay, so if you're going to get this process of QE, what you'll see are monetary hedges zooming in the next few years, and that means gold, and it means crypto. Uh, now, the the sort of the spooky corollary to that is that last time this happened, when you saw serious threat to paper money systems in the 1930s, gold was banned by the US in 1933 or 1934, if I, if I remember my history. And that's one of the dangers you've got in the current space. Are they going to try and find ways of actually stopping investors putting money into crypto or these monetary hedges? Uh, I would think it's probably too difficult now to do that. I know what you think. It's a it's large and owned by a lot of people now, and, and it keeps rising. One of the things I've done is also I just divided various assets by just the Fed balance sheet or the G5, either way. And what you found is, is the S&P went nowhere since 2008. Right. Gold actually didn't go anywhere, so it, I, it offset the debasement but didn't actually gain anything. Real estate, same. The only ones that did were crypto and technology because right. they were secular trends. Yeah. Um, and those two massively outperform the Fed balance sheet. And once I kind of saw this, I realized that, you know, if this is the world we're in, then there are only really two assets. You, yes, you can own gold and it will work. But if you actually want to make money in addition to the debasement, you've only got a couple of assets you can really own. Right. Makes sense. Over a full time. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I mean, we're in a world where debasement has to be the order of the day because, you know, governments, I mean, you can see in many ways how governments are acting even in the last few months. And what is of absolute importance is the integrity of their sovereign debt markets. They will do anything to preserve those sovereign debt markets. And you can see that in the example of not just Japan, but more uh, explicitly, look at what happened in the UK gilt market, the British gilt market in September of last year. Uh, Gilt sold off. That was a you know a, that was a huge shock to the system. The Bank of England changed overnight from a QT policy, which they announced only days before, to full fledged QE again. And if you look at what the Federal Reserve has been doing over the last few weeks, and arguably I would say actually since the British gilt crisis, but in more in terms of stealth easing, they've been actually trying to underpin the Treasury market as well, and in fact the more general financial system. They have come back. Uh, with liquidity, and that's the reaction every time. And the point is, and I, I you know, to come back to your uh, your illustration of the post two thousand and eight world, I think it's an extremely good one, and we've got to think a lot more about that because basically before two thousand and eight, uh, credit markets relied to a large extent on trust. Post two thousand and eight, they demand collateral. You've got to have collateral. Collateral is what the financial system is all about. Now, if you want to get scared by this. Take a look at the fixed income markets and something which is a wonkish concept, but you'll re you remember from Goldman days or whatever, the term premium. Okay, look at the term premium on the US Treasury market. It's published every day by the New York Fed. Okay, that number is not just negative, but if you take out the inflation trend in that data, it's the most negative it's ever been. Now, textbooks will tell you that term premia should be positive, not negative, but they're hugely negative. They're the lowest they've been since records began in 1961, right? Now, what is that telling you? It's telling you there is an excess demand for collateral in the system, okay? And that is a fundamental problem. Uh, and that's why the financial system is potentially fragile. And that, and it's another way of saying why the central banks have got to keep coming back and papering over the cracks with more liquidity. Yeah, and I think Basel III was another big part of that. Yeah, you know, part. the forcing of the massive hoarding of collateral means there's an endless collateral shortage, which endlessly makes the dollar go up because it's a game of musical chairs because the whole world is a dollar funding mechanism. And as you say, they have to keep papering over the cracks because when something goes wrong, there's not enough collateral in the system, and it happens time and time and time again. Yeah, and you can actually, if you, look at, uh, if you look at the fixed income markets globally, there are principally two uh, markets worldwide, the Bund market and the US Treasury market, where you see this phenomena of very negative term premium. And those are the two markets where you've got, you could call pristine collateral. Yeah, the other thing, by the way, I looked at, I, as I went through and checked my numbers about this interest payments and QE, 
And it worked for Japan, it works for the UK, and it works for Europe. They're all the same. And it kind of felt like that maybe the central banks made an agreement that this is what they would do. Maybe the BOJ were the people who figured this out before everybody else. So I looked at the, all of the balance sheets, and they're basically interest payments plus anything they have to directly inject into the banking system in terms of, of bailouts, you know, which is the extra on top, because that's not the government funding side of the equation. Do you think that they might all know what they're doing? Because everyone always assumes central banks are morons and that they don't know anything. But when you kind of look at it and you think, huh, maybe you are just all monetizing the interest payments because you all hit 100% of GDP and debt at government level. What do you think? I think it makes sense. I mean, I, I, they're certainly not idiots, that's for sure. Uh, you could argue that they may be a step behind the markets always. I mean, that was that was something we always felt uh, at Salomon Brothers, that uh, you know the Fed was in a learning process, and certainly the, the Japanese authorities were in a big learning process. So we're always, you know, uh, a couple of years ahead of what they of what they were thinking. But ultimately, they catch up and they put a lot of resources there. I think if you look at the alacrity with which central banks have moved in the last few weeks, it shows that they're actually concerned about the financial system. You know, I would suspect in these upcoming uh, IMF meetings, which are you know slated to go on the next few days, you're going to see a coming together of policymakers saying they are going to avoid a banking crisis at all costs. The reason being is that it's absolutely in no one's interest to have a banking crisis now because you're presenting a gift to China. Okay, if we if China sees a banking crisis in the West, they'll say, "Look, told you so. Don't rely on these guys. You've got to come with us and try and help the yuan." be a new currency alternative. So don't give China anything like that. So there'll be a coming together. And I think what that means is that central banks are going to offer more and more liquidity support. So your whole like, thesis and idea that they're onto this, I think, makes huge sense. In fact, there is a uh, on Twitter, which uh, uh, I know you, you play it and I play it as well. Uh, if you look at Twitter, there is a comment by uh, a former central bank uh, or official, uh, and she said that what's going on right now is she terms it a daisy chain of support among central banks supporting the treasury markets. Now, I'm not sure about the size of that. There may be some debate about it. In principle, I think it makes huge sense. Yeah, because it's they just can't let this whole thing fail. So I just want to complete the big picture, and then we'll dig into where we are now. So a lot of people hear what you're saying and they immediately say, well, inflation. Now, where do you stand on structural inflation? Are you disinflationary natured or do you think that we create a higher level of inflation with all of this? OK, I think the, the, the first thing is that I'm fundamentally a deflationist because I think that what the world is going through is a, is a Japanification. I think Japan has, has shown the world what happens. And I think demographics are a huge, huge factor here. So I believe that that's where the trend is. On the other hand, if you look at what's happening in terms of central bank uh, liquidity injections, in other words, it's monetization, you've got to say that there, there is a case uh, as we've seen in the last uh, two years, of that liquidity spilling over from time to time into the price level. So my view is that the trend in inflation is probably downwards or it's low, but we've got a lot of volatility uh, in that inflation rate. So that's the problem. Now, if you look at the the maybe the nearer term outlook, I'm certainly wedded to the idea that inflation comes down quite fast over the next few months. I think that's likely. I think we're already seeing evidence of that. And one of the things that I've always maintained is that if you're valuing, let's say, equities, you don't value equities against bonds. You value equities against inflation. That's what works best, in my experience. If inflation is coming down, equities should do pretty well. And you know what you're seeing right now is that equities are climbing a wall of worry. Okay, But that's always the case, is it not? People are trying to trying to project, you know, the next recession, how deep it's going to be, et cetera, et cetera. But the equity markets seem to be looking through that. Now, what I would say is that all the work that we do on fixed income, and we, you know, from, uh, from our analysis, we look at liquidity, we see how that affects fixed income. Fixed income markets, you know, they, they don't lie very much. There's a, there's a lot of truth in what fixed income markets are really saying at any one time. And what the fixed income markets, in my estimation, are telling us is there is a bottom in the US economy around about the mid-year, okay? I'm not saying the economy avoids a recession. It's probably going to be quite shallow, in my view. And one of the reasons I think it's shallow 
is that if you look at the yield curve, which everyone now quotes as uh, as a sort of the uh, the signpost to deep recession, the yield curve is hugely biased by these negative term premia. Now, the term premia are nothing to do with economic expectations or rate expectations. It's to do with a shortage of collateral. So what they're really telling us is more about potential financial fragility than real economic fragility. And so in my view, you're going to get this shallow bottom in the economy around about the middle of the year. Um, and if that's correct, uh, stock markets, in my experience, tend to discount, what, about six months ahead. So the rally we've been seeing since the beginning of the year seems pretty much on track as far as I can see. Yeah, and also because if the only outcome is more liquidity, then equities essentially become, and crypto and everything else, essentially becomes a probability weighting of more liquidity because liquidity is what's driving it. It's a duration play. That's all you need. Basically, what's happening, the equities are a high duration uh, asset class. If you put more liquidity in the system, you want to take more duration risk. And that's basically what's going on. Here's another question for you. How come the Chinese credit cycle leads all of this? What is all of that? I mean, you, I think you've seen it as well. It just seems to be ahead of all of this, which seems counterintuitive. What do you think? Well, I think it's, it's ahead right at the moment. Um, and I think, you know, the way that we tend to, well, the way that we do look at things is that we cover across board in 90 economies worldwide. Now, if, you, if there's a long tail on that. So if you, if you sort of cut to the chase, there are only two that really matter in the world. And that is the Federal Reserve and the People's Bank of China. Okay. Uh, the ECB more or less follow, you know, when they, when they make any sense, they more or less follow the Federal Reserve. Bank of Japan is pretty much in the same pocket. Uh, and so what you're talking about, and Bank of England, let's forget about those. Um, you're, you're really talking about um, two independent, two key central banks. Um, what, the Jap well, sorry, what the Chinese have been doing um, since the end of COVID or since the lockdowns uh, ended is they've been goosing their economy with big liquidity injections. And what you're seeing is a very significant pickup in the amount of liquidity that's going through the Chinese financial system. Uh, and that's why you've seen this bottom in the Chinese markets. And effectively, uh, that is likely to be playing a bigger and bigger role in terms of lifting the world economy in coming months and helping commodity markets go up. It also seems very difficult for China, which has got a really bad demographic and a lot of debt, not to rely on on monetary stimulus. You know, the BOJ have kind of taught us the lesson here. There's no other way around it. Yeah, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the fact is, that how is China going to grow? And China's really got, you know, there are, there are three engines of growth in the, you know, for any economy, consumer spending, um, capital spending, infrastructure, or export growth. Now, China has relied to a great extent on the latter two, um, infrastructure spending, people say, well, that's spent. But actually, if you look at what they're doing currently, is they're releasing more funds to local authorities uh, in China, which means there's going to be more infrastructure spending. They're basically, you know, treading the same path again. Uh, they've reined in the shadow banks for much of the last five years, but they're actually now giving them a bit of slack. So you can see this lending picking up again uh, to that area. So there will be you know, more bridges to nowhere or whatever it used to be called in Japan, there will be this sort of infrastructure boom. But that's all they've got. They have to deliver growth in the Chinese economy. And there are very few ways of doing that, particularly if the world is becoming, if you like, more uh, more questionable about taking Chinese exports. Uh, they may ultimately have to devalue the yuan quite significantly. Uh, they'd held up against that for a long time, but they certainly prepared to let it go at the end of last year. Um, uh, it's revived a bit since. But I think in the longer term, you may be looking at a yuan US dollar cross, which is nearer 10 than current levels of seven. Uh, I think that's quite plausible. The other question, the overriding question is, can they allow consumer spending to pick up? And that's what they always say. If you look at the five-year plan, the annual five-year plans in China, every year they publish these things. They say, we're going to enfranchise the consumer never happens particularly. And the reason is that's, that's politics. If you, enfran if you enfranchise the Chinese consumer, I think they want democracy. Um, and that's what they can't, they can't have. 
So that is always that, you know, you can't allow that to happen. And what's more, the distribution of income in China is so skewed away from households, much more towards state owned enterprises and, uh, uh, and the Communist Party that, uh, you know, again, why would they give up that? They won't. So the only thing they've got, as you rightly say, is to tread the, the previous path and go down the credit route or go down the export route. Yeah. And with a very rapidly aging population, old people do not spend money. Yeah. So how do you have a retail boom with a bunch of old people? Yeah, and particularly Chinese consumers, they don't. They tend not to be big spenders anyway. Um, you know, compared with with Western consumers in general, they tend to save mo- money. And the older generations are much more wedded to that anyway, as we know. So where do you think we are now in the global monetary cycle? Things are picking up. There's you know, there's a lot of debate, and I see you on Twitter. It makes me laugh about the people, the QE not QE. Like it doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Liquidity came into the system, but talk us through. Where we are now and how you think this plays out over the kind of next 12 months, knowing what you know? Well, look, um, we've gone on record as saying a bull market in liquidity started in October of last year, okay? Uh, and we're in the early months of that. Uh, that cycle will last through until about 2026. That's what the normal cyclical pattern says. So we're in the early stages of that. Uh, it's not going to be a straight line upwards. Uh, there'll be difficulties. But, you know, hey, we're, we're beginning that journey. Uh, around the trough of the cycle, you always get banking problems. SVB, Credit Suisse, not a great surprise. Um, but central banks are now onto that, and they're trying to repair or at least tape over the cracks in the system. There will not be a major banking crisis because central banks are there trying to support things. In terms of what is important in driving liquidity, it's not just central bank balance sheets. It's the value of collateral. Uh, one of the other things we've been uh, arguing is that, you know, equity investors, for example, need to look beyond the VIX index, which is their traditional measure of risk, start looking at the move index, bond volatility. That's what's critical, because if bond volatility falls, you're likely to see co- a collateral uh the ability to use collateral increase significantly. Collateral values uh, will go up in that environment of lower bond market volatility. And so central banks have got to get bond market volatility down. And that's one of the things I think they are doing behind the scenes. So uh, in other words, uh, there are two drivers. We look at uh, measures, uh, we, we also look at weekly measures of liquidity. They've spurted higher since October, but importantly, the driver of that has been a pickup in collateral values and an increase in central bank balance sheets. That's come through both from the Federal Reserve uh, and from the People's Bank of China. Bank of Japan has also played a role, has helped, uh, but generally bank balance sheets are increasing. And what you're seeing since the low point in liquidity in October is something like an 8 to 10% increase in liquidity from that point. So it's been meaningful. Now, what about the future? Where, where do we go? I think the, the key thing, and um, uh, I may have uh, added a slide in the pack, but one of the things that you know viewers ought to be looking at is to go onto the Congressional Budget Office website and look at the projections of the, the U.S. fiscal balance over the course of the next decade. They publish estimates out to 2033. And what you see there is a widening deficit. But more particularly, if you start to drill into the numbers, you'll see there that the CBO actually factor in a rising share for the Federal Reserve taking up Treasury debt. Okay, So in other words, there is uh, acknowledgement that the Federal Reserve has to play a bigger and bigger role. QE has not gone away. It is not dead. It is there. Okay, uh, You may call whatever you want to call that, as you say, there's a debate about QE. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is liquidity is going into the system. But interestingly, the authorities, not just in the US, have changed the goalposts. What they're now saying is that QT is not withdrawing liquidity. It is basically letting debt government debt roll off central bank balance sheets. That was never how I understood it. It certainly wasn't how they originally painted it, uh, but they've changed that, and that gives them a way out. So what you've seen in the last few weeks in the US is that treasuries have continued to fall off the balance sheet, but the Federal Reserve has just injected half a trillion dollars into the US money markets following SVB's failure. So the liquidity has gone up. Now, how do you think about the the balance between the reverse repo and the Treasury General account? So the reverse repo is clearly enormous amounts of money trapped in that right now. And 
at some point, Jan Janet Yellen's talked about it. There's, it feels that maybe that's one of the tools that they will use at some point to free up the reverse repo market. And then we've got this balance with this TGA getting drawn down ahead of the uh, the debt ceiling and what that means. How do you how do you think of all these things coming together for the US? Yeah, I mean, the, these are sort of complex questions which will affect the markets in the next few weeks. Um, April is normally a big tax take uh, season or month for the US. We'll have to see the extent to which uh, uh, taxes come in. That may uh, improve the size of the of the TGA, give them some space. But effectively, that money, as you infer, is actually a withdrawal of liquidity from the system. So they may have to offset that on the other side of the ledger by, you know, uh, expanding uh, their support in terms of uh, of uh, bank funding or maybe not allowing treasuries to roll off so quickly. So that could be a factor. The other one is the reverse repo. Um, the reverse repo, uh, in the words of some Fed governors, is a signal that there is lots of excess liquidity in the financial system. In all honesty, that's complete rubbish. It's a signal of the generosity of the Federal Reserve in paying high interest rates. That's all it is. But that money is locked up. It's on the Fed balance sheet. It's not circulating. So the money funds who are putting money into the into um, the reverse repo are basically that the, the the velocity of that money to put it another way is basically falling it's it's zero velocity so the federal reserve is taking it out of the system that needs to be put back in in some way the easiest way to do that once the debt ceiling issue is uh, is resolved is to start issuing a lot more treasury bills and i suspect that's what they'll have to do so bill finance will go up to satisfy the demands of the money funds yeah, it feels that um, also, you know, if we look at the system, uh, the issue within the banking system, they've falsely constructed a yield curve by creating a half percent interest and then they invested it and that didn't work out fine. But it feels that this deposit flight is going to keep happening and it keeps going into the reverse repo via the money market funds or whatever. And the Fed are going to have to cut rates very fast at some point. Where are you on the on the rate cutting side of this equation as well? Well, I, I hear what you say. I think there is. Um, um, I think that's the inevitable conclusion that they'll have to get rates down because it's going to be extremely difficult for them to finesse things. The difficulty they've got, and it's like the you know the old saying uh, in, in Ireland: if you want to go to Dublin, let's not start from here. Uh, but they've they've got that mess they've got to face, and the real issue is that you've got this debt ceiling debate which is going on. Now, that's clearly a frustration. It's not helpful. It is likely to run on until probably mid-year, I, I would imagine. Uh, and it really thwarts the ability or the flexibility of the Federal Reserve or the US authorities. What they really need to do is to get the debt issue resolved, to start issuing Treasury bills significantly to draw down that reverse repo. Uh, that may help, but ultimately they have to get rates down. And that's really, that's, that's really the problem. So I agree with, with what you're saying. I think the, the problem that we've got or the problem that more generally markets face is, do you really want to go back to a zero interest world? And I think the answer is not. The problem with that particular scenario is that if you go down to very low interest rates, you're incentivizing people to take on more debt. And that's the problem. Ultimately, we've, we're, we're taking on too much debt. Now, it's okay in a way, <laughs> famous last words, if the government sector takes on the debt, okay, uh, but if the private sector is saddled with that debt, you get a lot more f uh, financial fragility. And the, the problem is that you know, that's, as I say, the world we're in. Uh, the financial system is not um, as robust as many people would think. Hence, the central banks have to keep coming in. They've got to keep supporting with liquidity. Liquidity spills over into other areas. But in many cases, we like the sort of asset price inflation and that is a consequence of that. It disenfranchises large parts of the country, we know. But, you know, we're looking at the financial markets here. And the other thing I just look at is I go back to that GDP formula and think, well, interest rates just need to be below GDP for it not to be too tight. And so, you know, if GDP trend rate of GDP growth is 1.75% or whatever it is, then they're going to have to be lower than that and the bottom of the cycle significantly lower. So I, I can't see a world where, you know, a lot of people I see them arguing, saying, well, rates need to, you know, bottom at 2% or 2.5% or two in this cycle. I'm like, I don't think that can happen. It has to come down. Now, maybe it doesn't get down to half a percent again, but it's still going to come low. There's no other way of doing it. Yeah, I think that, I mean, you know, rate, rates, we're, we're pretty much at the peak of the rate cycle. 
and rates have to come down. I think the, the debate is how fast. And, you know, my only concern about the Treasury market is that what you're sitting on is a very negative term premia. And those term premia can only likely go up from here. And they will go up if liquidity, in other words, QE expands again, which I think inevitably will. And you've got a big increase in debt issuance, which is surely coming. So that's going to put upward pressure on term premium. So the outlook for the long end of the market may not be as wonderful as people would argue. But I do believe that you're going to get rates coming, you know, rates will come down at the short end. Do you think that yield curve control is part of that future just for these dynamics? We've seen it in Japan. Japan have kind of led the way. I think that's what's going on. I think the, uh, you know, I think the, the main focus of, uh, of government or treasuries and monetary authorities in certainly recent months uh, in both the US and Japan and the UK has been attempts to, oh, and, and in the Eurozone, have been attempts to try and control the yield curve. That's what they've got to do. They've, the yield curve control is, you know, is coming to a high street near you soon uh, if it's not already there. I mean, this is the reality. And that's all they can do because, you know, the interest bill, if the interest bill starts to go up, it compounds and this debt environment starts to get absolutely unworkable. And that's why I think, you know, we're, we're in this world where if you start extrapolating into the future, the only way is to look for monetary hedges as alternatives in the way that we've discussed, whether it be gold, whether it be uh, crypto in some form, uh, or whether it be actually uh, technology. Yeah, I mean, I got to exactly the same conclusions. I'm like, you know, everything else you're probably going to lose money from because this is the biggest, most dominant macro factor that exists today. And a lot of people still don't see it. They're still using old ways of looking at things. But liquidity has gone from being an important component to being literally everything right now. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the correlations, I mean, historically... Uh, you look at the correlation between liquidity and, say, the S&P, uh, had a correlation coefficient uh, looking at from maybe the start of the 80s through until uh, 2010 of about 0 0.5, 0 0.6. But as you rightly say, for the last decade, it's been near a sort of 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a phenomenal difference. Uh, liquidity is all important right now in terms of what markets are about. I mean, we can see that because, you know, you look at what happened. I mean, if the turning point genuinely was October and the British guilt crisis, which I think that's what marked it for me, um, I saw a change in attitude going on. And actually, what's more, at the time, I made the point that what seems to be happening is a bifurcation of policy, where they're using interest rates to uh, control inflation, and they're using the balance sheet for financial stability reasons. Now, that was a conjecture, but actually that same opinion has now appeared many times in the media since. So it looks as if it's beginning to be fed out by the central banks. This is what they want people to understand. So I think we've got that situation. From that October low point, liquidity has picked up, as I said, from by 8 to 10% in absolute terms, and many, many markets have bottomed. Okay, So what have you seen? You've seen the crypto space explode upwards. You've seen the gold market go up. You've seen equities bottom and pick up. Technology has been a leader. Okay, you know, what more evidence do you want? Yield curve is beginning to steepen. Okay, the yield curve always steepens about six months after uh, the first inflection in the liquidity cycle. That's how at Salon Brothers we used to trade the yield curve. Those were, you know, fundamental points. Liquidity leads the yield curve. It's doing it again. And when you tell people this, you know, I mean, I have a very similar view to you. And, you know, I also see a mild recession bottoming. We've probably got a couple of nasty, a month or two left of nastiness where maybe the ISM gets down to 40, who knows. But then it bottoms and comes up quite quickly. People just don't want to believe that equities are not going down. Right. It's such a staggeringly strong pushback. Mm. People are angry that equities aren't going down. It's kind of weird. Exactly. I mean, exactly this point. But I think they're listening to sort of tr traditional economics too much. And, you know, the track record of, of economics predicting the stock market is, uh, is woeful. The stock market predicts the economy, not the other way around. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it, it's amazing to me to see it because people, they kind of want their crisis. But I think you can't have it. Not with the use of liquidity anymore. It just it doesn't exist, as you said. You can stop a banking crisis immediately by printing money and putting anything on the balance sheet. Even this commercial real estate issue that's brewing, well, we've seen the ECB. They just took everything as collateral and said, fine, we'll just lend you money against it. We'll take any old shit, chewing gum, wrappers, anything. We'll just take it and we'll give you the money. 
back to 2008. They, they learned how to do it in 2008. They had a dry run in 2020, and they're doing, they can do it again now. Mike, listen, fascinating conversation. You know, you've been amazing with this work that you're doing on liquidity, and I think it's really important. So just it was great to chat with you and learn a bit more about it. Good, Rob. Well, enjoyed it enormously. Thank you. So I thought that was a really fascinating conversation. Mike and I come to the same conclusions, which is that the use of central bank balance sheet and liquidity overall is really the biggest force in all of macro. And until you understand that, if you don't understand that, you don't understand anything anymore because your models won't work. Your price earnings ratios won't work. How you value things don't work until you understand how liquidity drives everything. And Mike has been bullish, as I have been bullish, based on the same reasons, and it seems to be playing out. Let's see how it continues. But the point being is, it seems impossible for there not to be more liquidity, more use of the central bank balance sheet in a world where every government is over 100% of GDP in debt. And that's just the public side. And then there's the private sector side as well. And that debt gets monetized. And that debases fiat currency over time, which drives up the price of assets. Again, a lot of people don't yet understand it, but I really urge you to start understanding how liquidity matters more than anything else. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.